So I don't know if you've ever heard of Guy Hines Jr. A lot of people have not heard of him. I had never heard of this. Um, I'm not even sure how in the world I stumbled across this case. I have no idea. Um, but one day I stumbled across it and thought, this can't be accurate, what I'm hearing. So I started digging. Oh my gosh, when I tell you that the, the story's been wiped from the internet, there is nothing. Now it did happen in 2009, so, you know, the internet wasn't that great. But even going back on the Wayback Machine, all of this stuff, it still was barely there. So I had to really rely on a Facebook group. And recently, his girlfriend and another person started a podcast. And she's been putting out a lot of information. Now, in the Facebook group, uh, he actually calls in from prison and answers questions and talks to people and all of that stuff. So it's been, it's been interesting to be able to be in the Facebook group and actually hear from him himself. So he does go in there, he does chat. Um, there you go. Bye, Marty. See you later, sweetheart. Um, I'm not playing with Marty today, not today. So we're gonna get started um, and <laughs> Candle Smith, he's out of his fucking mind. So we're gonna get started. I'm gonna edit all of this first part out um, because it shouldn't be up here. It's just me babbling and being on my telephone. So I became familiar with the case a couple of months ago and I'm gonna try to show you guys as much as I can, but like I said, a lot of this has been wiped off of the internet and the best resources are on the screen, uh, a Facebook group called Guy's Voice and uh, another resource is the podcast. Hey, David. So I'm going to read you guys an opening statement from the judge, which I found to be a really, really interesting statement, what he had to say. The reason I find it so interesting is because once we start getting into this, hello always, you'll see that not much of what this judge asked for was actually met. So, hey Zariah, this is the opening speech, the opening statement from the judge and the information that the judge gives to the jury and what they need to do. This person is presumed innocent. He enters the trial of this case with the presumption of innocence in his favor, and this presumption remains with him until it is overcome by the state with evidence sufficient to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty of the crime charged. No person shall be convicted of any crime unless and until each element of the case is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden rests with the state to prove every material allegation of the indictment and every essential element of the crime or crimes being charged beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the state is not required to prove guilt, to prove the guilt of the accused beyond all doubt or mathematical certainty. Reasonable doubt means just what it says. It's the doubt of a fair-minded and impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. It's a doubt based on common sense. It does not mean a vague or arbitrary doubt, but a doubt for which a reason can be given based on evidence. A conflict in the evidence or any combination of these. There is no burden of proof upon the defendant whatsoever, and the burden never shifts to the defendant to prove his innocence. If after considering all of the facts and circumstances of this case, your mind's wavering, unsettled, or unsatisfied, then it's the doubt of the law and you should acquit the defendant. If no doubt exists in your mind and the guilt of, in the guilt of the accused, then you would be authorized to convict the defendant. If the state fails to prove the guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, it will be your duty to acquit. The jury has an important role and it's to determine the facts of the case, to apply law to those facts. You must determine the facts from the evidence. Keep that word in mind. <laughs> 
The object of this trial is to determine truth. You must determine the credibility and believability of the witnesses. It is for you to determine which witness you will believe and which ones you will not. You must be a fact finder and it is important for you to determine who you find believable. That is for you alone. Now, it's important you pay close attention to the evidence during this trial. With the evidence and an open mind at all times, reach no conclusion until this trial is over. Do not jump to any conclusion before all the evidence is presented. Very interesting opening speech. Very interesting. I uh, thought this trial is going to have a lot of evidence. This is the trailer where the crimes occurred. And I'm going to play you a 911 call. <laughs> Nine one one. Where's your emergency? Oh, uh, New Hope Plantation, uh, Highway Seventeen North. Okay, by New Hope. What's going on now? There's a guy just came home and uh, his whole family is dead. He's trying to stop, but I can't understand. I haven't gone over there yet. Okay, tell me what the address is. Try to get that address for me. Uh, one four one one four five one forty six one. And it's around to the back side. The Hope Plantation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, he just came screaming over up to my dog. My dog will bite. He, he, he's got a dog out there, too, that on the porch that may bite. I'm going to have to try to contain him. This is, this is, uh, this is Guy. I don't know what his last name is. He said his dad is dead. Uh, Rusty's dead. He said everybody's dead. I know there's a, it's a house full of people that live there. Okay. It, 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 What's his it, name? He's it, freaking out. It's Guy. Guy, what's his last name? Guy, what's your last name? What's your last name, honey? Huh? Yeah, here, tell me. I just got all my whole family doing it. Okay, tell me what's going on, sir. What? I just got home from, I was out right there, I got home just now, and everybody's good. I was my dad's good. How many people are there? There's about six, my whole family's dead. Okay. It looks like they've been beating them. I don't know, man. Okay. I mean, I don't know what to do, man. Okay. Do you press the gun coming for you? Just stay on the line with me, okay? Okay. <laughs> That was the 911 call. 10 people shared a 900 square foot trailer at New Hope Plantation Mobile Home Park. Around 8 a.m. when that call was made, on August 29th of 2009, Guy Hines, who you heard on the tape yelling and speaking for a little bit, arrived home after being out for many hours. He entered the mobile home through the front door. The door wasn't locked and it always remained unlocked because nobody had a key. There was no air conditioning in the trailer and all the windows were open. 
Guy went into the home briefly and ran back outside yelling to his neighbor, the lady that you heard on the tape, to please call the police. She said she had seen Guy just drive up shortly before she heard him screaming for help, saying that his entire family was dead. She remained on the phone with 911. She handed the phone off, as you heard, to Guy, as well as the maintenance man. His name is Mr. Dixon, or Mike. So, we're going to get into who the mobile home was rented to. There were 10 people who lived in there. And the mobile home was rented to a man named Russell Toller Sr. Russell, by everybody's account, was one of the nicest people on the planet. He had worked for 20 years at a plant that dries chemicals and food products located right behind the mobile home park, but he had been laid off several months before. The group was actually in the process of being evicted and moving because they had too many people living at the residence. They had already informed the park manager that they'd be leaving by September 8th. This was a group of people where some were actually blood related, but they all considered each other family, okay? Many news articles will refer to Guy Sr. and Russell Sr. as brothers, but they weren't actually blood related. You heard Guy crying on the 911 call saying, my whole family's dead my dad, my uncles, my cousins. No, Regina, we just got started. (laughs) So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the victims in this case. Let me see if I can get the photos up here without going over. This is Russell. He is 44 years old, and everybody who knew Russell loved him. It was said that he lived by the standard that if you don't have anything nice to say about somebody, you don't say anything at all. He was a very hardworking person. He loved his children and he was very loyal. I am going to include people's criminal history in this because it is relevant. Russell had a very simple battery charge against him from years prior that had been dismissed. The battery charge was against his former wife's new husband. Again, those charges were dropped, okay? This is Chrissy Toller. She had many run-ins with the law. In 2006, she was sentenced to 10 years probation and a fine after being convicted of conspiracy to commit armed robbery in an attack on a couple at a motel. Her sentence was a plea bargain because she testified against her child's father and another man. The men were given 30 year sentences. In 2005, Jimerson, which was her child's father, and two others were accused of robbing two men who said that Chrissy and another woman had promised them sex. The charges were dropped because the victims could not be located to testify. She was also charged with simple battery for assaulting her mother. Russell Toller Jr., he was also known as Homeboy. Let me see if I can find a photo of him in here. I do have a photo of him, but this is uncooperative, which is why we had such a problem today. Such a problem today. I want to be able to show you their photos because that's important. Sorry, just one second. So that is 
Jr. They also called him Homeboy. He was 20 years old, and he was known to be hardworking like his dad. Those who knew him said that he was very humble, he was hardworking, he loved fishing, he had no criminal record at all. This is Michael, who was 19. He was born with Down syndrome. He had several other health problems, but he was high functioning. He was known to be very happy, loud. He was always with his dad, and his dad felt like Michael might not have a lot of time on this earth, so for every minute that he's here that I can show him happiness, that's what I'm going to do. And he was always with his dad. <laughs> this is Michelle. She was 15. She was always smiling as well. She loved her dad. She loved to fish, and she had no criminal record. That's their family. This is Brenda. She was Rusty's older sister. She had had a stroke and was in a wheelchair at the time of her death. She was also known to be a pretty solid woman, very loyal. She had stuck by her former husband until the day that he died. They had suffered a really sad tragedy 20 years prior when she lost her son who was seven and her husband's son who was 20 in a house fire. This is Guy Hines Sr. He was a very generous friend. He kept his nose clean. He worked hard. He got up early. He went to bed early. He was very close to both of his sons, Guy and Tyler. He did have some very minor run-ins with law back in like 1985. They were like traffic violations and things like that. This is Joseph West, who was Chrissy's boyfriend. Despite some issues, Everybody said that he had a good heart, you know, he was a kind person. He had pled guilty to possession of cocaine and was sentenced to five years probation in the year 2000. His probation was revoked due to failing a drug test. He did have a forgery charge and a receiving stolen property. He never did any serious jail time at all. So, that is our of people. The crime scene. So the crime scene is, uh, this was, you guys have to understand, this was a 900 square foot trailer that housed 10 people and a three-year-old. Uh, Chrissy did have a son, a three-year-old. He survived the attack, but he did have some severe wounds. He did survive. Michael survived only for a day or so, and then he passed away. So this is a very small space for all of these people to be living in. The crime scene was bloody. The officers described it as the worst that they'd ever seen. Uh, Police Lieutenant Keith Stavely was one of the first officers there. He made the initial assumption that everybody had been shot based on his first impression of what he saw. Another officer on the scene named Roderick Nohilly, he'll become important in this, actually spoke to Guy Jr. He asked Guy if he knew anybody who might have wanted to hurt his family that disliked them enough to do something like this. And Guy told them no. You know, there was nobody that he could think of that would murder the entire family even a try to murder a three-year-old child. And, I mean, a, a woman in a wheel, wheelchair, a boy with Down syndrome, and a three-year-old, who would do such a thing? So they asked Hines, since he was the only one there, what did you do all day? Where were you? You know, where have you been? So he gave them uh, where he had been. He told them he got off of work around 4.30 and he came home. He smoked some weed with Joe, and he purchased some crack from Joe as well. Then he left in Rusty's Mercury Cougar. The time that he left was, I'm not 100% sure. Some articles say it was a little earlier. Some say it was around midnight. He came back home and purchased more crack, 
And around 2.30 in the morning, he met up with his brother Tyler at the Best Western Motel. They later went out to breakfast together. There are videos, a video surveillance system saw him just before dawn, which I looked it up, and dawn was 7.09 a.m. on a uh, surveillance camera. So two times this clerk says, yes, I saw him. There was nothing unusual about him. And he wasn't bloody. He didn't look panicked. He, you know, there was nothing. There were other people who testified, yeah, we saw him. You know, we saw him around uh, 2 in the morning or 3 or whatever it was. Then he went to breakfast. He had a receipt for that. You no, know, he, you know, he wasn't covered in his family's blood. So Guy Jr. went on to say that when he came into the mobile home, he checked his dad by putting his hand on his chest and he checked with just visually everybody else. He saw Michael was alive and he can be heard on the 911 tape yelling, tell them to hurry, Michael's still alive. Hines said that he found the house phone on the living room floor and he was trying to use it to call 911. Um, as he went back into Michael's room, he was very out of it, okay? He had been up all night, he was smoking weed, he was doing crack, he hadn't slept, he'd been at work all day. So he was kind of all over the place, okay? Um, he found his cousin's cell phone and tried to use that. He saw a shotgun that he knew in his mind, shit, I've got to get this out of here. Uh, it's stolen. So he grabbed it. He put that in the trunk of the car and he put the cell phone in there while telling his neighbor, please call 911. So he is telling the police this. He said, yeah, you know, there's a, the guns in the trunk. And uh, they went in and they looked at the gun and oh, of course, they had to ask if there were any weapons there because at that point, they're looking at these people and thinking they had been shot. They're not really sure what had happened to them. So Officer Nohilly noticed a smear of blood on Guy's shorts, but no other blood was on him anywhere. They began to check around the scene. They checked the car. They found the gun. And I'm going to show you a photo of that gun. Or am I? So this was the gun in the trunk. There's no blood on the gun. There's no bloody handprint on the gun. There's no blood anywhere on the plastic. There's no blood on this, what appears to be a white bag here or the sheet there. So how can one even, I don't know. It's so I spent five hours recording this video today and I got maybe 25 minutes in. <laughs> the amount of uh, information, what I ended up doing was buying a subscription to the Jacksonville Online Times and paying for the live blog. So you've got to go back in time and take notes and there's so much that I was able to get from written news articles from this one man named Terry he covered the trial, but in order to get the transcripts, it's some outrageous amount of money, like twenty or $30,000, something absolutely mind-boggling. So there's no way to get the transcripts, which is just sad. I wish I had those, but okay. So they bring Guy down. They want to talk to him. They want to get more information from him. And while he's there, they charge Guy with tampering with evidence, which was removing the gun because it could be evidence, obstructing police, and drug possession. So they did find a bag of pills in the car that he was driving. So they charged him with these things, and they ended up having several press conferences because now people are like, oh my God, is this guy a suspect? And it was stated, no, he was not a suspect. His arrest were, was for other issues but he was questioned as to his whereabouts. Now, it's my personal opinion that somebody who's been up all day and night and on crack and smoking marijuana 
probably should not be somebody that you're questioning about a murder at this point because he's probably a little bit out of it, but they did. And he was hysterical. He had just lost his entire family. Now, we are going to go over some dates here. We'll try and keep this in chronological order, okay? Keep in mind, this all happened on August 29th. Now he's been arrested for drug possession and obstruction of justice, okay? September 2nd, he appears before the Glynn County Chief Magistrate Tim Barton, and his bond was set at $20,000. He was ordered to home confinement or work and had to wear an ankle bracelet, okay? September 4th, all of the funerals begin to happen. And sadly, they cannot find an ankle bracelet for Guy to wear. They can't find an ankle bracelet for him to wear so he misses the funerals of his entire family, which was just baffling to me. Later on September 4th, as the mourners left Howard Jones Noble Funeral Home, the Glynn County Police Chief, Matt Doring, announced that Hines has been arrested on eight counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. I want you to keep in mind that Guy Himes is five foot, eight inches tall and weighs 180 pounds. When the police saw him, he had a smear of blood on his shorts. There was no blood on his hands. There was no visible blood in the car. There was no blood anywhere on his shirt, his legs, his feet, his face or anywhere else. He had a smear on his shorts. The people that I told you about, there were four capable grown men, Joe, Russell, Guy Sr., Russell Jr., and Michael in that home. The police chief said at a news conference Friday night that two pieces of evidence had come in late in the day that led to this arrest. The chief declined to provide any additional details about the evidence against Hines or any possible motive. What he did say is this is a very this is very much an ongoing investigation. Two pieces of information have come forward. We took those two pieces of information compared to the whole of all the evidence collected all week, and that led us to believe that Guy Hines Jr. is the responsible person. He said that the warrants were served to Hines in jail earlier in the day. He had just been released, so he was released, the warrants are served, he's pulled right back into the jail. There's not much more I can say, the chief said. I know you have a lot of questions. So, on September 6th, I found a news article. It was stated that in the hours in which the crime occurred was likely between 8 and 12 hours prior to the 911 call, which came in at 8 a.m. on August 29th, which was Saturday. That would put the time that the crime occurred between Friday, August 28th, between the hours of 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. So, 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. Now, the only person that we know of for sure who went to sleep often early was Guy's father, Guy Sr. So, making it those hours and not middle of the night hours confused me even more because people would still be up. And you'll see why this theory doesn't fit at all. It's nearly impossible. Keep those hours in mind. Tyler said that he last saw his brother around 5.45 a.m. on August 29th, less than three hours before God made those calls. I already told you that around 7.10 a.m. the sun rose there and he was seen on camera and by a store clerk at a store. So we know from at least 5.40 a.m. to 7 a.m. nothing happened. We also know that he came knocking on the motel door and that there's a witness at 2.30 a.m. So now we have 2.30 a.m. until about 7 a.m. 
where he couldn't have done any of this. On September 8th of 2009, Captain Marissa Tyndale, head of detectives for the department, said evidence indicates more than one weapon was used to inflict the injuries. On 9-16 of 09, a grand jury hears three hours of evidence from Detective Bill Darris, the lead investigator. Guy Hines was not invited, nor did he request to be part of this grand jury. In November of 2009, an article on Jacksonville.com states that they collected hair samples from two of the victim's hands, Russell Toller Jr. and I believe the other one was Michelle. They also said that they had to take pubic hair from Guy for analysis because earlier in the day, Guy had shaved off his hair in the kitchen. In an interview, Rusty Toller's sister says, I don't think Guy did it. I feel 100% that he did not do it. Not only does she believe that one person could not have killed all these victims without help, she also questions how he had no markings of any violence whatsoever on him. How could he go there, go wash up and come back and not be exhausted? Not only that, that was the only family he had. I believe that he's innocent. She vowed to begin working to raise money that day to provide him with the best lawyer possible. She did not believe that he would get an adequate representation for an appointed public defender. May 26 of 2010, Guy appears before Chief Superior Court Judge Amanda Williams. Prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. Joseph Vigneri and Charles Nestor of the Georgia Capital Defender's Office were assigned as his attorneys. Williams denied a blanket motion from the attorneys who sought to close all pretrial hearings, seal all court findings, and impose a gag order on the police, lawyers, and court personnel. Williams reserved the right to close some, but she said her court is and always will be open to the public. Well, I wish I could find that public hearing because it is nowhere on the internet. She says, quote, I do not believe in private trials. This is not a star chamber. The right of the public and the press to have access to the courtroom of, of, is of the highest value. I want you to keep something in mind. Glynn County is kind of known for um, corruption. If you go and search for Jackie Johnson, you will see that uh, this person is not, not very good. <laughs> uh, we'll get more into that part later. So July of 2000, a backlog at the state crime lab slowed down the processing of the evidence collected in the case. And <laughs> here's the crazy thing. They said that they collected anywhere from four to a thousand pieces of evidence in that 900 square foot trailer. Okay, keep that number in your mind because that is a hell of a lot of evidence to collect. And they collected it all, from what I understand, in the bathtub, okay? They put everything in the bathtub. December 27th, one of the attorneys asked Judge William to allow him to withdraw from Heinz's legal team. Judge Williams orders the attorney to remain, saying it would be way too disruptive to the case to get a new attorney at this time, which, thank God, because he was offered um, some position somewhere else, far further away. I want to make sure that we are not buffering or anything. Some position somewhere else. No, we're not good. Okay. So. February 2011, we are almost getting to the trial, guys. I promise you we are. It's going to be a lot. Uh, District Attorney Jackie Johnson updated the court on the status of the potential evidence in the case. She says there are a thousand or so items identified as potential evidence, and the defense should have a list of all of that. Some of the evidence was at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation awaiting analysis which was on hold because of the defense. They had some funding concerns and had not hired a DNA expert yet. Judge Williams ordered the defense to go to the Glynn County Police Department within 30 days to examine potential evidence 
and decide what needed to be analyzed to keep this case moving. Eventually, Mr. Vigneri does leave the case and a new attorney steps in. His name is Newell Hamilton. He's also with the Georgia Capitol Defenders. Whew. August 2012. Lawyers asked the judge to toss out Guy's indictment because of the makeup of the grand jury. His first indictment was dismissed because there was a felon on the grand jury. Just so crazy. Hey, Lori. So now we are at the pretrial. April 2000. Are we stuck? We are stuck. I look like I'm stuck. I don't know. Am I stuck to you guys? <laughs> are we stuck? I think we are. We're good now? Okay, good. Let me move my hands here because it's not moving for me. Let me open this door, guys. Oh, there we go. There we go. So... Okay, what would it be without some screwed up interruptions, right? So April of 2013, they want to set a trial date for August of 2013. The defense says the DA's office is withholding evidence. They said that the audio tape and video surveillance had been lost. Attorney Hamilton says, quote, there are over 5,000 pages of discovery coming in and they need more time to review them. They asked for the trial to be pushed to January of 2014. Prosecution replied with, I've dealt with 4,000 pages over the years of case evidence and you don't hear me whining. We are ready to go. The arrogance from the prosecution in this case is, um... okay. The trial of Guy Hines begins October of 2013, four years after his arrest. This is part of the opening statement from the state. I'm going to play that for you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As the judge said, I'm John Johnson. Uh, I am a special assistant district attorney. I work for uh, the district attorney, Jackie Johnson. The defendant in this case is charged with eight counts of malice murder. This evidence is circumstantial evidence. And by that, I mean there is no videotape of what happened inside that trailer. And he's right. There is no videotape of what happened inside this trailer at all. There isn't one. So he says, the evidence items in this case will be shown and you as a jury will eliminate every other reasonable inference except that this defendant committed these crimes as a party or as a direct individual. About 8.18 in the morning, Margaret Alinsky is up and sees the defendant drive up to her window lot 147. She does not see him go inside, but a few minutes later, she hears him hollering that he needs help. He is hollering that his family has been beaten to death. Someone call 911. Now it's important to note that the evidence shows he is hollering that his family has been beaten to death because he is the only person who in fact knows what happened to this family and they were beaten to death. You will hear from the evidence in this case when the police arrived, they went into the house, and they thought the family had been shot. That was their initial impression. The defendant is hollering about his family being beaten to death. Other statements that he made. Nobody heard anything out of the ordinary. Now, someone did say, actually, that they heard dogs barking in the middle of the night. Another thing that he said, the defendant had no blood on his hands. Were Guy's hands tested for blood? 
Guy stated that he checked his father's pulse, but by the way his father is laying down, that would be impossible. These are things that the prosecution said. Now, how must somebody lay for you not to be able to check their pulse? I'm not quite sure, but that's what he said. Mr. Johnson, the prosecutor, told jurors the story of what he believed to have taken place inside the trailer. He mentioned the butt of a shotgun located beside Russell Toller Sr.'s head, but the barrel was missing and never located. He mentioned Russell Toller Jr., who was dead under a table and had been stabbed several times after being beaten to death. Referencing the 911 call, he said Guy knew how his family was beaten to death, implying that Guy was the killer. But he goes on to talk about the blood and how much there was in the house. Yet, Guy had none on his hands at all. He talks about Michael, who Guy says he sat beside on the bed and points out that there are no, there is no blood from Michael on Guy's shorts. He said Guy told him he also touched Michael's stomach, but there was no blood on his hands. He said Michael had been the most savagely beaten and there was blood all over the bed and the room. He points out that the dog on the porch was aggressive, but no neighbors heard it barking, implying whoever did it must have known this dog. Prosecutors believed that Hines returned to the family trailer early in the morning, high after a night of smoking crack cocaine, knowing his uncle, Russell Sr., had strong painkillers, and he set out looking for those tablets. When he was confronted by Toller Sr., prosecutors said Hines completely lost it resulting in Toller and the other seven residents of the trailer being savagely bludgeoned to death. Autopsy results shared during the trial revealed the victims received over 220 injuries between them, and each of them died of a brain and head injury. Although the murder weapon was never found, investigators believe the victims were beaten to death with the barrel of a shotgun. Hines Jr.'s defense team implored the jury to consider the chances of a single man being able to contain and beat eight people in a small trailer with not one of the victims escaping. The defense also believed the police had concentrated on Hines Jr. being the perpetrator from the very beginning, and this gave them tunnel vision with regard to any possible suspects. So... The jury heard a lot about DNA evidence, okay? I'm going to show you a little bit of this crime scene. So that's the gun. This is um, Guy's father. Michelle fought back and had some bones in her hand broken. Keep in mind the brother, the um, the cousin, the cousin was not just beaten to death, but he was also stabbed. This, which you can see here, do you see how this looks um, like brownish? That's blood. That's how much blood was just on this one bed alone. It was the amount of blood in this house was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. Okay, so we're going to talk about the DNA evidence. The GBI, the lady's name was Kristen O'Malley Fripp, testified that she did DNA analysis on the blood of the gray black reversible shorts that police said Hines was wearing as underwear. Okay. So guy was wearing these shorts underneath a pair of tan shorts. Okay. So do you see that little spot of blood right there? That is what they tested. This blood belongs to Russell Toller Sr. and Chrissy 
and Michael, okay? That's who that blood belongs to. It shows, I mean, it is so small, right? So, there was also swabbing of a piece of paper taken from the trailer that they said had the blood of Russell Tolbert Sr. on it. A fingerprint examiner for the GBI said that there was a bloody palm print left by Hines on another piece of paper. I tried to find out more about that and was told that that evidence doesn't exist, that it is nowhere to be found, uh, which I don't really understand that. I don't know how it could be not there. So they analyzed swabbings that forensic biologist Barbara Ritzer took from sandals that police seized as evidence. So what guy had on that day was a collared shirt. These, you know, they're like basketball shorts underneath his khaki shorts. He had a pair of flip flops. He had a pair of boots that were his work boots. He only owned two pairs of shoes. This was a very poor family. They did what they could to support each other, but they were very poor. And he had a pair of work boots that he left at his co-worker's house and a pair of flip-flops, okay? So they took those things from him. They put them into a bag together, all together, not individually separated, which, why wouldn't they individually separate these things? They took his flip-flops, the gray shorts, and the khaki shorts, and the shirt, and every, and they put them in a bag. And it stayed in Officer Nohilly's car for 24 hours in the bag. Could some of the blood that was on his outside shorts have transferred over to these shorts? Or could blood from the flip-flops have come off onto these? I have no idea, but it sounds like that could be a possibility. One swabbing from the sandals matched the blood of West and another matched Guy Hines Sr. One sample of the khaki shorts that belonged to Guy matched the DNA of Senior and another matched Junior. She testified that the shotgun she tested had the blood of Russell Toller Senior on it. She did an analysis on the shotgun stock and it had spattered blood of Toller Senior. Police said that they found the gun stock lying at his head but they never located the barrel. Keep the barrel of that gun in mind. I know. I really need your attention on something, a 26 trod murder. Okay. You can email me at chasing truth, the number two, and I will be happy to look at it. So, the gun stock on the shotgun was broken off and it was laying near the man's head, okay? And it, of course it had blood on it. These people were brutally beaten to death, right? But the barrel was missing. They never found it, but they insist that that is the murder weapon. They've never found it. Nobody knows where it is, but they say that that is what killed everybody. And there is a man in the Facebook group, and I'm going to show you his post and a little experiment that he did. It's going to blow your mind, okay? So, blood on a cell phone that police took from the car that Guy was driving was that of Joseph, Joseph West. So, the blood that was on the phone was Joseph's blood. The only cell phone mentioned as possible evidence in the trial belonged to Michelle and was the same one found in the car. Now, whew, Hamilton, the defense attorney, said that the former manager 
of the mobile home park guys called the police a month after the murders and she had found a bloody pair of nunchucks you know nunchucks that you use really fast and they were made out of pipe and secured with a chain she called them and said i just found these nunchucks sitting in a tire is this something you guys would be interested in and they said oh yeah absolutely the officer who spoke to her was officer owens who was at this time no longer a police officer at the time of the trial but he was asked about the report from priest and he said no i don't think so i don't, I don't know about that he didn't recall that they played the video the the audio tape of her phone call him saying that he was going to collect it nothing was ever done with that evidence whatsoever. It wasn't tested to see if the blood matched any of the victims at all. It was just, nobody knows what happened to it. It's, it's God knows where it is right now. The GBI medical examiner testified that all eight victims died of brain injuries while being beaten with a long, thin object. I'm going to read the injuries to you. It's graphic. If you are not a person who can handle hearing about things like that, then it's probably better that you mute what I'm going to say because these injuries are extremely graphic. Guy Hines Sr. had 22 evidences of external injuries. His ear had been torn almost completely off. He had 17 internal injuries. Russell Toller Jr. put up one hell of a fight. That's their words, not mine. They said Russell suffered from nightstick type injuries, indicating he was struck with something long and narrow. He had 36 external injuries, 14 internal injuries. Several of his teeth were knocked out he had stab wounds to his neck and his chest. Hair was found in Russell's hands, and Donahue said it was bagged and preserved for further examination. Russell Toller Sr. had 33 external injuries, including deep gaping lacerations. He was stabbed in the face and the neck. His skull was broken into several pieces. Knox testified on the pictures of the room where Russell Toller Sr. was beaten to death. He went on to say that Toller had put up a huge fight for his life and there was clear evidence that he had been struck while standing or lying in four separate locations of the room. He also testified that the evidence in the picture indicated at one point Russell Toller Sr. had been struck from both sides of the bed at the same time could clearly not be done by one person alone. Michael Toller died from brain injuries. He was beaten in the head and had skull fractures. Joseph West had seven external injuries to the back of his head, one so deep that it split his skull all the way from the outside into the flesh. They believe West could have been sleeping when he was killed. Brenda Falligan had 38 external injuries, a laceration that went all the way to the bone, injuries to her hands that were believed to be defensive wounds, injuries to both sides of her head and her face. There was blood spatter evidence to indicate that Brenda had a pillow placed over her face while she was being beaten. Evidence also indicated that she fought furiously and waved with her left arm. The arm had a print indicating that it had been held to prevent her from hitting her attacker. One hand was holding the arm and the other hand was holding a pillow over her face. Who was beating her to death? Chrissy Toller had 24 external injuries. Both sides of her forehead, her jaw and her face were fractured. Depending on the position of the person, Donahue said that it may have been one blow that caused multiple injuries to her. 
Michelle Toller had 48 external injuries. The back of her head, her forehead, her neck, her eyes, her nose, her mouth, her face, her chest, and her hands. A blow that was so severe it exposed the inside of her skull. Many of her teeth were loose or missing. Two bones in her left hand were broken. Loose hairs were taken from her right hand and given to the crime lab for investigation. They claim that three of the victims tried to defend themselves. Donahue said that a long slender object similar to a shotgun barrel or a garden tool or a pipe might have been used. He was asked by the defense attorney if he could exclude multiple similar objects and he replied, no, I cannot. <sighs> that is a lot. That is a lot, right? <laughs> so, yeah, definitely more than one person. I mean, those over 220 different injuries done to all of those people in a 900 square foot trailer that had no air conditioning, that had the windows open and had fans on. Everybody would have had to been in the deepest of sleeps for one person to come in and use the barrel of a shotgun to beat people in their head so severely. Some of these people had 30 and 40 injuries to them. How could one person have done that? and not left any blood on themselves. And let's imagine that Guy did this, okay? Okay, he did it. Crack makes you do the craziest things. So he did this. Where did he go to wash up? Where did he go? Because they tested every inch of that car, and there was no blood at all. He didn't go to any neighbor's houses and there was no blood in the bathtub. So how is this possible? I don't know. So, hey Beth, he would have been covered in blood, right? More forensics testimony. Jonathan Arden, a VA, a former chief medical examiner in Washington testified saying he believed multiple weapons were used stab wounds from a knife, as well as injuries that were cutting and not from a blunt object or knife. He did not believe one person could have killed eight people. Arden estimated it would have taken at least 20 minutes to beat all of these people to death. Michael Knox, a former major case investigator with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, now a forensic science and criminology consultant. He says, I doubt one person of could have killed all eight. I estimate that three to five people did this. Using blood spatter patent analysis, he stated there was evidence that Chrissy Toller, Michelle, and Wes were moved around, or that they were moving around. Evidence that Chrissy tried escaping through a window. Russell Sr. was beaten from both sides of his bed as he tried to escape, and a pillow might have been used to cover Brenda's face while she was being beaten. Russell Jr. fought back and was beaten and stabbed in the kitchen by at least two people. Now, there is evidence to show that Russell Jr. had bloody handprints on the bottom of his jeans, as if somebody was trying to pull him while they were beating him. So, I'm going to show you that. a lot. I've never heard of a case like this before. Not ever. I have so many things saved. <laughs> Sorry. Let me show this. So, it's 
hard to see, but all of this dark is blood. Here, this area shows a handprint grabbing his leg. You can't be grabbing somebody and getting blood on you and then not have any blood on you and be beating the person and stabbing the person and still not have any blood on you and be able to do that with one set of hands. You can't really grab people and murder people all at the same time, I wouldn't think. And he was young and he was strong and he fought back. And guys, Jr. had no wounds on him whatsoever. None. The crime scene was contaminated. Tyvek suits were not used. Evidence was not preserved. Evidence was tracked from room to room by the police as they walked through the house. Whoever committed this crime, he theorizes, would have been covered in blood. I think we all can agree with that. He also brings up the nunchucks with the blood on them that were found by the park manager. They were lost. Nobody knew where they were. Glenn Police Captain Thomas Tyndale said they were looking for the barrel and the receiver of the 20-gauge shotgun as well as a knife. He testified that the nunchucks were not in any tire, as the manager stated. The manager of the mobile homes also reported a framing hammer that might be of interest. Nobody at all followed up. They just had in their minds that the person who did this was Guy, period. The person who did it was Guy, and there was nothing else that they were going to say about that. So, let me show you one thing here. Now, If I can find it, here it is. So this is from the bathroom. What do you see there? Okay, Sass. This was August 29th of 2009, Beth, and they had the trial in 2013. Now, we're just at the part where they are trying one person for this murder, okay? Well, so Helen says blood, Zariah says blood. What would you think if I told you that this was in the bathroom and not any bodies were found in the bathroom? There was no blood in the sink. There was no blood in the toilet. There was no blood in the bathtub and there was no blood on the floor, but there was blood on this, whether it's a t-shirt, I'm not really sure, there was blood on it. Do you think that that blood was tested to see who it belonged to? Because it was not, it was not tested. Nothing was done with it at all. So we're gonna leave this up for a little while because these pictures are just so graphic. And this is Guy when he was just a little guy. So his defense attorney maintained that Guy's behavior was not that of a guilty person. In questioning Lieutenant Keith Stavley, who was one of the first people on the scene, he said Guy never became a suspect to him referring to why he interviewed him while he was traumatized and admitted to being under the influence of drugs, he says, well, I didn't really feel like he was a suspect at all. I didn't feel like he was the person. So I decided to interview him. During the initial scene, Guy tells that same officer he took one of the shotguns, he put it in his trunk because it was hot, stolen, Guy didn't hide this information or try to hide the fact that he even had the gun. He also had Michelle's phone in the car, and he never tried to hide that either. During the taped interview with the police, Guy admitted to being on drugs that night. He was asked perhaps if he did it while he was high, and he replied, no, no, that was my family. So, 
I'm going to play a little bit of I'm going to leave a link for you to be able to watch those jurors because you're not allowed to play the BBC's um, videos on you, unfortunately. You will get flagged. You're not allowed to play them. But they did ask him, uh, did you do this? And he said, no. You know, this is what? No, that's my family. I love them. No, I didn't do this. So, guy stated that he didn't he didn't do it, and he didn't know of anybody who would do it, and that the shotgun was stolen, so he grabbed it out of the house and he threw it in the trunk because he was afraid. And it turns out the gun wasn't even stolen. <laughs> it was bought in 1985 by Toller Sr. So was he thinking of the other gun? No, nobody knows what he was really thinking. So the cell phone that belonged to Michelle, the one that was in the car, guy said he used it to call 911 or that he tried to, but the last call was made hours earlier to a friend of Michelle's, okay? Keep this in mind. There were phone calls made from that phone in the middle of the night to people who were Michelle's friends. So that would make sense that Michelle is making phone calls from her own telephone in the middle of the night because she was awake and not dead. Someone had tried to use the phone, Michelle, at 3.45 a.m. So that still tells you she's alive. Keep in mind, Tyler, the brother of Guy, said that he came to the motel room and another witness said the same thing, that he was there around 2.45 and that they went to breakfast and he saw him at 5.45 in the morning. And then he was seen at a convenience store two times just before 7 a.m. So, Guy also said that he went to uh, this park and was smoking crack there because he felt safe. He felt like, you know, nobody's gonna see me. I don't know if crack makes you paranoid. I don't know the situation there but he didn't want anybody to see him. So he was there, it was a place that he said he often went, and then that was it, okay? So, guys, lost his remote, guys. So he got off of work around 4.30, came home, smoked some weed, bought some crack, left in his cousin's car, said he came back later, went to the same window at the trailer where Joe West usually was, bought some more crack, and then went out to St. Simmons Island. He met up with his brother between 2.30 and 3 at the Best Western. He had breakfast with his brother. Then he drove back home. I opened, this is him speaking. I opened the door and I saw my dad like that. I got hysterical. I told the neighbor, call the law, call the law. I touched my dad, but nobody else, except for when I found Michael. When I looked in and seen my dad, it didn't look like him. Something had torn up his face. So, testifying on behalf of Guy was a Zachary Matajat. We're just going to say Zachary M because that last name, I don't know. He said that Hines worked with him and his father and that they would build houses. Guy's employer said Guy was a great employee. He never had any issues with him whatsoever. So Zachary says they picked up Hines at New Hope Mobile Home Park and drove into Elonia in McIntosh County to work on a house. They quit early on August 29th because it was raining. They met the contractor at Longhorn Steakhouse. They got paid and they went off to cash their checks. By noon or one, he, Guy, and his girlfriend went to a nearby Bubba Garcia's and had lunch. We had plans to go out later, and we were just going to go to a couple of bars. Still in his work clothes, Guy said he would go to a nearby store to buy some clothes, and he left there walking around 5 or 5.30, but he didn't return back. He spoke later with Guy's brother, Tyler, and Guy's father, Guy. He and Guy had talked about shaving their heads that night, 
and Guy told him, yes, I did do that later on at the house. <laughs> Lieutenant William Darris, who had been under cross-examination for several hours, testified that Guy Jr. was allowed to wear the Glynn County Jail, wear to the jail the same shorts he had worn the day that he reported the murders. He acknowledged that investigator Mark New testified that he saw no blood on the shorts. Neither did Darris. Nobody saw any blood because they were not covered in blood. Okay. Other investigators have said that the shorts were reversible and the gray on the other side is where the blood was apparent. Who put these items into evidence at Glynn County Detention Center? The shorts. That's what they were asked. Former investigator Mike Owens picked up the shorts at the jail on September 1st and they asked, was there any record of anything being done with the shorts and how did they store them before they turned them over the next day? Quote, for at least 24 hours, Detective Mike Owens had Guy's items in his personal possession. Isn't that right? Hamilton asked. And how do you know if he sealed them before you got them? The reply from the detective in charge here, the officer in charge was, because I would have freaked out if he hadn't. He added, think about these shorts. They were dark and you couldn't see the blood on them. You would think if a man whose entire family had just been killed was being brought in for some questioning, that you would examine everything that he had on. But, you know, the thing about these shorts, they were dark and you couldn't see if they had any blood on those. The blood on the shorts was also dry, he said. In assertion, he was saying, well, there was blood on the shorts, but the blood was dry, trying to cut off the defense's theory of the clothes being bagged together and they could not have been contaminated, cross-contaminated. That could not have possibly had happened. So, Assistant District Attorney John B. Johnson asked Doris about the weapons known to be in the house where the victims lived. Doris said two, the one with the butt beside one of the victims and the other one that was in the trunk. Did he have any chance to go back inside the trailer? And they said, well, yes, he had gone back inside. They asked about, would it be possible to walk through this crime scene and not get any blood on your shoes? And some of them said no. But here was the funny thing. Guy's flip-flops only had blood spattered on top, but not on the bottom. This family was known for walking around barefoot, right? And they're saying that it was very suspect that there was only blood on the top, there was not blood on the bottom of his shoes, but Doris had no blood on the bottom of his shoes either. The officer who walked around the entire crime scene. <laughs> My goodness, guys, I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. They left the evidence in a vehicle overnight, guys. They left it overnight in a bag. The bags are not washed, okay? So whoever had the bag prior to Guy's possessions, that DNA is mixed in there as well. Nobody really knows. So here's another huge issue. There's something called lead sheets, and that means that a lead is called into the police station, and the police are obligated to determine if any leads are credible whatsoever, if and to write them down, right? Because let's say that myself and Beth are the detectives on, and we switch out shifts, okay? Somebody calls in and says, hi, I have a credible threat about that murder that happened in the trailer park. And I say, okay, tell me all about it. I then write it down and I write down that it's 10, 11 p.m. And that I'm going to go check this out in the morning because my shift ends at 11. Beth starts at 11 
and somebody else calls in, it is now up to Beth to look back and see if I filled anything out on any leads for this specific case so that they're not duplicating the efforts so that they can say, oh, no, uh, Officer Tracy already has your information. We're definitely going to be following up with this. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you need to tell us? Guess what happened to the 70 pages of leads that they allegedly had called in. Anybody want to guess? Nothing. 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 They were not followed up. They no longer exist. Nobody knows anything about them. They decided they didn't have manpower and they didn't have time to look into this. So they didn't. Let me tell you about some of the um, people who called in. <sighs> a tip had come from a man named Dwayne regarding a threat made to Toller Sr. Quote, we will kill your whole family. He was possibly a gang member of the gang called Insane Gangster Disciples. Andy Anderson was named as a possible suspect. He lived in the same mobile trailer park. No Hilly said he tried to find him but came up empty. He never tried to find him, okay? He later learned that Anderson was arrested weeks before the death and was in jail at the same time of the slayings. Now that's a note that I took two weeks ago, okay? Since then, I've listened to the podcast, Guy's Voice, and found out that Guy's girlfriend and the person who's helping with this investigation have found 20 different Andy Andersons, all within this area, who weren't in jail, that nobody followed up with whatsoever. They just, they just didn't follow up because they had their eyes set on Guy, and that was the end of the story for them. He did it, no murder weapon, no blood on him, no blood in the car, no blood anywhere. They took the pipes in the bathroom, you know, because you would think if this guy did this, he had to have gone into the bathroom and washed all the blood and changed his clothes, right? So there would be blood in the pipes. You know how people do that. And then you see in the movies, they're like bleaching everything, trying to get rid of it or whatever. Do you think they tested the pipes? No, they didn't test the pipes either. There was a handprint. I'm going to try and show you the handprint if I can find it. I believe it was on this bed. I could be wrong. I might be mistaken. But there was a very large handprint, a bloody one. Do you think they checked it for fingerprints? They did. But only for guys. And it wasn't guys. They didn't test it for anybody else's. So it was irrelevant. When asked about the motive of why they bought, thought Guy killed his family, they said, I believe he came back to the trailer sometime that night and he wanted those pills from Michael. He got into a confrontation with Rusty. He was going to get those pills. He also wanted money. Well, when Guy was arrested, he had over $300 in his pocket from his check that he got paid that day. There was only $61 in the trailer. Hey, honey lot. Thank you. The fact that no one in the home worked was not an indication, according to this officer, that they didn't have money. <laughs> he stated that West was seen on camera at a store earlier in the day. So that means he had money and he believed Guy wanted that money. The amount of money that was in Guy's pocket was $391. So let's see, let's see, let's see. What questions? Do you guys have any questions yet? Because I know this is so much, but um, there was 
Albert Rowland, a latent fingerprint examiner for the GBI, testified he received a piece of paper with a red stain on it, and the red stain was a bloody palm print of Guy Hines. Now, I don't know what happened to that paper, and I did ask in the Facebook group, but I don't think I ever got an answer on that. So, I don't think that I did. Um, let me see here. There were other witnesses. Richard was Guy's boss, and he said the guy was one of his best employees. He had to hire two people to replace Guy Jr. Also, he said that Guy Sr. had won a judgment in court and gotten a mobile home back that he had formerly lived in in Darien or something. Now, the judgment was like for $25,000, but it was all being appealed. So Guy didn't have any money. Guy Sr., right? And that was one of the theories that he really wanted to kill him because he was getting this money and he was going to do things for other people and he wasn't going to do anything for his sons and it just wasn't fair. I'm going to show you how far this went. This is... This here was something, okay? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? They just lied. So, all of this happens. Nothing is tested. People just are a mess. Nobody cares. And all along in the documentary, it seems like they're going to find him innocent. With the amount of information that we're hearing here, there's just no way, there's no way that they wouldn't be able to. Well, there was an issue with one of the jurors and they had to dismiss that juror. So another juror came in and when they did, you know, they were like an alternate. So it was like, okay, well, you know, we're going to have to bring you in here. And they did. And the death penalty was on the table for this. Okay. And let me see if I have it here. I don't know if I do. I thought that I did. It's a little ridiculous at this point. So, I wanted you to, I think I can try to bring this up without, hopefully without getting flagged, but I'm not sure when I tried to listen to this before I got flagged immediately. The witnesses are now entering the as the flames licked my head and my lungs filled up. I can't believe it, right? They're just... What? How could this be? It's the same reaction I had when I watched the entire documentary. I was... I didn't know what in the world to think. So I really just wanted to find out more. And I joined the Facebook group and this is it. And you guys can, it's very active. This is happening now. Guy calls in from jail. He uh, speaks. This is his podcast. Um, Jody is an angel. <laughs> She's helping him as much as she possibly can. His brother Tyler is in there as well. You guys should definitely join uh, the Facebook group as well as listen to the podcast. It's going to give you so much more information than I possibly can. But I wanted to see what I could do to get it out there. Um, even if it's only seen by a few people. Um, where'd you go? 
where did who go? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean. So you guys definitely should. Uh, he is currently serving life in prison and um, he tried to do an appeal and they denied that. So there is a petition to compel the Georgia Supreme Court to examine this case. Right now we have 1168 um, signatures. It is very long. It's worth you reading it for sure. Um, I'm going to, I don't know why this is such a long link. But there you go for that. I don't know what happened. It looks like uh, for some reason I cut in and out, but that's weird. But if you join the Facebook group, then you there's a link in there to the um, to the podcast, to the change.org, to all of that information. The podcast is really good. They actually just did one today. Um, I'm not sure when exactly it will be up. I don't think they just go up live like that. So that is it. That is all for now. Um, unless there's more information that comes out on this, we are going to be looking back at Ivan's case because some new podcast episodes are out. So we're probably going to try to do that uh, during the week this week. And I appreciate you guys all for sitting through this whole thing. It's been a lot. Guy really needs everybody's support and help. I hope that you will join the Facebook group and um, share this, share the podcast share the change.org petition, get that information out there. He is somebody's loved one and he is innocent of this crime. This is far too much to convict one person of. There's no way. And thank you guys. I appreciate you guys so much for sitting in here with me. And I'll probably see you tomorrow, maybe, hopefully, I don't know.